Hey guys and welcome back to my channel for another episode in my mystery series where today I'm going to be talking about the story of Holly Bartlett, a 31 year old woman from Halifax, Canada who went on a night out with friends in celebration of the end of her university year. A friend put Holly in a taxi and while she allegedly did make it back to her apartment building, she never made it through her front door. Today we're going to be exploring Holly's story and her family's never ending fight for justice. As is all too often the case with these videos of mine, the police brushed off Holly's case almost instantly, saying it was an accidental death, but as you'll come to see, there was much, much more to Holly's story that they didn't consider. Before we get into the case, I do want to quickly shout out my main sources, as there are three main ones I relied on really heavily for this video. There was an article entitled Holly Bartlett's Unlikely Journey by Tim Bousquet on the coast from December 2013. There's AMI's six episode podcast, What Happened to Holly Bartlett, hosted by investigative journalist Maggie Ra, and the documentary by the same name, What Happened to Holly Bartlett, which brings us nicely onto the sponsor of this video, Magellan TV. I first watched this documentary on Magellan TV many months ago, and ever since then, this case has been one that I've been meaning to cover. I've been working with Magellan TV for a very long time now, so I'm sure you don't need to hear my list of all the reasons why I love them so much, but they're a documentary streaming service with more documentaries than you can possibly imagine. They've got everything from true crime to science to history and more. The documentary What Happened to Holly Bartlett follows the investigation into what really happened to Holly on the night in question, featuring interviews with those who knew her the best and the private investigators on the case, doing an actual investigation into Holly's movements before she died. Through these interviews, computer animation and dramatic recreations, it builds a story of what actually makes sense and begins to form an actual possible answer. The documentary is really well made and I always appreciate hearing from actual friends and family members, people who know the cases best. If you want to try out Magellan TV for yourself and watch what happened to Holly Bartlett, you can click on the link in the description box to claim your one month free trial. And whilst you're at it, you can explore all the other true crime history documentaries they have as well. So let's begin by talking a bit about Holly herself, who honestly seems to be just a really incredible woman. I know it's a bit of a true crime cliche to say that the missing or deceased person was amazing, but that really couldn't be more true in the case of Holly Bartlett. She was born on Boxing Day, so the 26th of December 1978, as the middle child to Marion and Wayne Bartlett. She had an older sister and her younger sister would eventually come along. From the day Holly was born, it was clear that she had a very strong personality, but she also had her struggles. She'd been born with a condition called microthalmia, a development disorder of the eyes in which both of her eyes were abnormally small. Although as a child she did have a small amount of vision, by the age of 13 she went completely blind. But Holly was stubborn as a mule, she never ever let her disability stop her from doing anything she wanted to do, and she refused to rely on other people, maybe sometimes to her detriment. She was fiercely independent, kind, loving, spirited, and had a nothing to lose kind of attitude. If she wanted to do something, she was going to do it, regardless of the fact that she was blind. She loved a horse ride and swing dance, and she wasn't even five foot tall, but was just this absolute force to be reckoned with. At the time of her death at 31 years old, she was working as a researcher for the province and was completing her masters in public administration at Dalhousie University. She had so many friends and led a really active social life, but her life in recent months had been full of highs and lows. Her dad, who she was incredibly close with, had been diagnosed with terminal lung cancer, so Holly had spent a lot of time just sitting by his bedside. She found it really difficult to come to terms with all this, but was determined to be there for her dad in his final weeks. On the night of the 26th of March 2010 though, Holly took a night off from her grief and went out with friends to go to a year-end party at the university club. She started the night off at around 6pm by going for dinner and drinks with a good friend Moira, with Moira later saying that Holly had around two drinks with her meal. Importantly, this meant that we at least know that she'd eaten something substantial that evening before spending the rest of the night drinking. We all know that alcohol doesn't hit you as hard if your stomach is lined with food. After dinner, her and Moira headed to a liquor store and bought a bottle of wine, and Holly put the wine on her credit card, telling her friend that she didn't need to worry about paying for it, but her friend insisted and gave Holly a $5 note, which was all she had in her wallet. 
Holly never usually carried cash, preferring to pay for everything on her card. But this meant that she did have $5 cash on her from this point forwards. This does have relevance later in the story. After the friends got their wine, the two headed to a small gathering at a friend's house. And I think it's probably what I would refer to as a sort of pre-drinks before heading off to the main party. At this pre-drinks gathering, Holly and Moira share this bottle of wine and somebody also makes a martini which they don't like, so they offer it to somebody else to take off their hands. Holly was the one who said yes, although it's not known if she drank the martini or not. Then the group headed to the graduation party where she had another drink before switching to water, probably knowing that she'd reached her limit. And she had important plans for the next day. She was going to a study group in the morning, then was going to visit her dad in the afternoon, so she probably didn't want to be hungover. All in all, Holly probably had around six drinks that night, from 6pm to around 11pm, maybe slightly after. The amount that Holly drank that night is a very important detail in this case, because as you'll come to find out, police later just dismissed her as a blind, drunk girl who made silly decisions. However, friends who were at the university party with Holly that night report that she wasn't overly drunk at all. As one classmate, Gabrielle Joseph, said to Tim Bruce Kay for the Coast article, If anyone is suggesting she was too drunk, I can assure you that was not the case. She was laughing, having a good time, not slurring her words. Some suggest that because Holly was so small, under five foot tall, the amount of alcohol she drank must have meant that she was off her face. But if I can make a sort of personal connection here, she was only about an inch smaller than me, we were around the same height and weight. Just because I'm small doesn't mean I can't handle my alcohol. Obviously it depends on the day and how much I've eaten and what exactly I'm drinking, but I could quite easily have six drinks. I went out a couple of weeks ago and had six, maybe even more cocktails over the space of a few hours, and I was absolutely fine. Tipsy? Yeah, of course. Drunk? No. Holly could easily have had six glasses of alcohol and have been fine. We know that she was at least aware enough to switch to water at the end of the night, something I also often do when I'm beginning to wind down. I obviously can't speak to Holly's exact experience, but as somebody around the same height and weight, that's my personal experience. I can handle my alcohol quite well, which does tend to shock people. Around 11pm, a friend called a taxi for Holly so she could head home, which did arrive just after 11.15pm, but there were still speeches going on and Holly wanted to listen to them, so the cab was either cancelled or was just waved away. A second taxi was called just after the speeches finished and arrived around 11.55pm. A friend helped Holly to the taxi, not because she was particularly drunk, but just because she was blind and needed a bit of help navigating her way to the right taxi. In an ideal world, the taxi would have just dropped Holly off at the entrance to her apartment building, Convoy Towers, where she owned a condo with a close friend. She would have gone in, gone to bed, and everything would have been fine. But for whatever reason that we still don't know, Holly never made it to her bed. It was early on the Sunday morning, just after sunrise on the 27th of March, when some steel workers turned up at the McKay Bridge to start their work for the day, unlocking the metal mesh gate to access the restricted area around the base of the bridge. At the north base of the bridge is a large concrete abutment, and I'm just going to take a moment to explain what the situation was here for my podcast listeners, or for any listeners who are visually impaired. I know my video viewers can probably see what the deal is on screen. As I said, this was a fenced off area at the base of the bridge with a large concrete abutment, a structure that supports the cables that essentially form the bridge. It kind of holds the bridge in place if we're really simplifying it. The abutments in question here were slanted at an angle, leading up to a sudden drop down to the ground in a sort of right hand side triangle shape. One of the workers spots a woman at the base of this large concrete abutment, who at first they assumed to be dead, but they soon realised she is still breathing. This was Nova Scotia in March, it was very cold, and it was clear that the woman, who we now know to be Holly, had been there for quite a while. The workers cover the freezing body with one of their big work coats and call 911. An ambulance soon arrives and Holly was rushed off to hospital. She was found to have bruises on her face and cuts on her hands and knees, her leg and some ribs were broken, and she had a body temperature of just 23 degrees Celsius. She was suffering with severe hypothermia. She was rushed into surgery just after 8am and her condition was touch and go throughout that day. 
Overnight, her condition got much worse, and by Sunday morning, the doctors agreed that keeping Holly on life support was futile. They were simply prolonging the inevitable, which was her death. At 10.45am on Sunday, March 28, 2010, Holly sadly died with her family by her side. In the What Happened to Holly Bartlett documentary, her mum Marion says how she had complete faith in the police in the early hours of the investigation, not having a doubt in the world that they would quickly get to the bottom of what had happened to her daughter, but that faith soon faded away. Police had arrived at the scene on Saturday morning whilst paramedics were still attending to Holly, and they noted that her bag was lying on the ground near her head, containing a number of items a bag would usually contain, bus pass, sunglasses, lip gloss, and ID card. Although different from most, Holly's ID card was from the Canadian National Institute for the Blind. This was investigators' first clue that Holly was blind. Notably though, she had no cash in her bag and neither was her mobile phone there or even was her white cane that she used to get around. Holly was blind, her cane was her eyes and Marion notably said to investigators that if they could find Holly's cane, they'll have their answer as to what happened to her, but it was nowhere to be seen. Police also noted that a black baseball hat with a Harley Davidson logo was found just to the south of Holly's body. But after this point, that hat would never come up in the investigation again. We don't know if it had any relevance or not. Throughout Saturday, they conducted their investigation. They reconstructed Holly's movements on the Friday, they checked her bank records, they interviewed everyone who'd seen her in the previous 24 hours. They tracked down the taxi driver who had dropped her off that night and asked him if he'd noticed anything unusual and he said no. He said he hadn't even realised that Holly was blind and had dropped her off in front of her building as requested, although she did get out of the taxi on the driver's side facing away from the front door. He also said that Holly was noticeably drunk. They also checked CCTV footage from the bridge and found that Holly had never been on the bridge that night, confirming that she hadn't fallen from the bridge or made an attempt to commit suicide. They used a search dog to conduct a search of the immediate area. Despite a five hour search, Holly's cane wasn't found by the dog nor by human searchers. But at one point, the dog did make its way through a small hole in the metal fencing that surrounded the compound. The gate to this compound had been locked, so until this point, unless Holly had fallen from above, nobody had a clue about how she'd got inside. Clearly now, though, they had their answer. Somehow, she had, on her hands and knees, crawled through this small hole in the fence, and then crawled up the steep concrete abutment and fallen 10 metres to the ground, causing the injuries that eventually led to her death. But how had Holly ended up here in the first place? The investigators concluded that drunk and disorientated, she'd got out of the wrong side of the taxi when she'd been dropped off at her apartment building, and instead of walking towards her front door, she instead had headed down the driveway. Somehow, she ended up walking 300 metres away from her apartment building, down the obviously sloping driveway, and then down Northridge Road, until she reached the area under the McKay Bridge. At that point, on her hands and knees for whatever reason, she crawled through the gap in the fence without her cane. By the time Holly died on Sunday, police had essentially ended their investigation and removed the yellow crime scene tape from the crime scene. Within just 24 hours, local authorities had determined that Holly's death had been a tragic accident. She was drunk, blind and disorientated but friends and family refused to believe that the death happened as the police described it, because investigators had failed to learn about who Holly was. Yes, she was blind, but as we know, Holly was incredibly capable. She was very independent and she knew how to get around and had an excellent sense of direction. She knew her surroundings. They were incredibly familiar to her and importantly, she was never stupid. Early on in the investigation, investigators had asked after Holly's carer, believing that she had to have had one because she was blind, which said everything her family needed to know, that they had no idea what it was to be blind. Something that's been very interesting to me in my research for this video is that very often you'll find families really trying to push the theory of foul play, that somebody had to have hurt their loved one because a lot of the time that is the case but I don't quite get that insistence from Holly's family in this case. They're very open to the idea that foul play may have been involved here, that somebody could have hurt Holly, but they're also still open to it being a tragic accident. 
just not in the way the police have described. Everyone who knew Holly in life has said there is just no way her death happened as the police have said. Holly deserved more dignity in her investigation than just being brushed off as a drunk blind girl. She deserved to be treated with more understanding and respect. Until they can have solid answers, her family want her manner of death ruled as suspicious rather than accidental. Her cause of death was eventually ruled as hypothermia and blunt force trauma, but they wouldn't know this for sure until her autopsy was released, which was a very long time after police had already ruled her death an accident. You see, what you need to know about Holly Bartlett is she was incredibly skilled with her cane and with orientation and mobility in general. For ninth grade, she went to a specialised school for the blind where she learnt these orientation and mobility skills and she continued refining them over the years. One of Holly's friends was a man called Peter Parsons, who was an orientation and mobility specialist with the Canadian National Institute for the Blind. And she met him in 2005 when she called him saying her cane skills were getting rusty and she needed to brush up on them. So the two met up and Peter was amazed that Holly's cane skills were actually perfect. She didn't need any help. But that's what Holly was like, she was always striving to improve. When you're blind, you generally have to learn new routes before you can manoeuvre them independently. So each time Holly had a new route to learn around Halifax, she would call Peter up and they would work on it together. He would later recall how he'd have to show her just once and she'd have it down perfectly. She was the most skilled student he ever had. Which is what makes the movements that she apparently made on the night in question so strange. To get to where Holly was found, she would have had to have walked down her driveway that led to the apartment, a route that she obviously took very, very often, every single day. This driveway was notably declined, something you'd notice whether you were blind or sighted. If Holly started walking down the driveway whilst disorientated, she would have likely noticed immediately and realised where she was. But let's, for argument's sake, say that she didn't realise. She then turns right onto Northridge Road, a road which very importantly runs parallel to the McKay Bridge. When you're impaired in one of your senses, you become more aware of the other senses. Holly would have relied a lot on sound to get around. Walking down Northridge Road, she would have been very aware of the sound of cars driving across the bridge to her left. Even though it was midnight, the McKay Bridge would have been very busy, it always is. Realising that the traffic was on her left, Holly should have realised that she was walking in the wrong direction and turned around, but apparently she still didn't know where she was according to investigators. She then continued on her journey and somehow ended up underneath the bridge, abandoning her cane to get on her hands and knees to crawl through a small hole in the fence. But Holly knew that if she ever found herself in a situation where she was lost, she should stop and try to get her bearings or just wait until somebody found her or make noise until somebody found her. There's no doubt between people who knew her that that's what she would have done even if she was drunk. When Holly's blood alcohol level was tested on the Saturday morning, she was found to be just over the legal driving limit with a level of 0.09%. Assuming that she'd stopped drinking around 11pm the night before, it's been deduced that she would have had a blood alcohol level of around 0.2% when the taxi dropped her at home. Granted, that is a very high level, over double the drink driving limit. But what we don't know for sure is how Holly reacted to having a level that high. Some people would be completely paralytic at the level, whilst others would be acting fairly normal. And the point still stands that friends who saw Holly leaving the party that night said she wasn't all that drunk, not drunk enough for this to happen to her. In a concluding report written on November 17, 2010, it was written that Miss Bartlett had consumed a significant amount of alcohol which placed her in a state of intoxication. This intoxicated state caused Miss Bartlett to have an initial fall just outside her residence at 5572 Northridge Road and a subsequent fatal fall near the location of the McKay Bridge. If you're confused about a reference to an initial fall just outside of her residence, I will come back round to that in just a second. To give you a further idea of how cursory this police investigation was, the superintendent of Holly's apartment building wasn't interviewed until two or three months later, and nor was anyone else in the apartment building, people who might have been awake or seen or heard something. 
It would also transpire that there was a wide angle security camera covering the car park, but it was never checked. And it was one of those cameras that eventually records over itself, so that footage is now lost forever. Who knows what might have been seen on that had it been checked in the early days. After the police investigation was over very quickly by the Sunday, friends sprung into action and went to search the site of Holly's accident themselves. Deciding to search thoroughly, looking for Holly's cane that they knew must be nearby, they walked the perimeter of the fence. Sure enough, quite soon into the search, they found the cane on the southern edge of the fencing. The hole that the police originally theorised Holly crawled through was on the western edge. The cane was at its full height, leaning up against the fence as if somebody had placed it there, about 20 foot away from a footpath. Near the cane was another hole in the fence that investigators hadn't reported. It's strange, isn't it, that a group of civilians was able to find the cane so quickly when an apparent thorough police search, including dogs, couldn't even find it at all. It suggests that either the search wasn't all that thorough, or the cane had been placed there after the fact by somebody who knew more about Holly's death. However, we'll never know which is true because Holly's cane wasn't taken into evidence. We don't know if it was ever tested or fingerprinted. A $5 note was also found very close to the cane, which is believed to be the same note that Holly's friend had given her the night before to pay for the bottle of wine. That note was never found in Holly's belongings, so we assume that that must have been it. Police didn't question the civilian search and instead just slightly changed their version of events to allow for this, saying that Holly had instead entered through the second hole in the fence. She made her way through the shrubbery and thorns after apparently tumbling down the slope that led to it after falling off the footpath above, which accounted for some of her injuries, the scratches and the bruises. But still, things didn't really make sense to Holly's loved ones. Peter Parsons, Holly's friend and mobility specialist, said that he went to police with his concerns, but it simply went in one ear and out the other. They knew that if they were to find out what really happened to Holly that night, they were going to have to do it alone. A group was formed of Holly's friends and family, naming themselves Justice for Holly. Luckily for Peter though, his dad, Brian Parsons, is a retired military police officer turned private investigator, and he went to his dad with his concerns. Brian began his own investigation. After canvassing the area around Holly's apartment building, he noticed that it was at the end of the number seven bus route, the same bus that Holly would take each day to get into work. Brian quickly realised that if Holly got dropped back home at the time the taxi driver said she did, the bus should have been sat at the stop at the end of the driveway, waiting to start its last trip of the night. Being the last stop of the route, it would sit there for long periods of time. Knowing that buses have dashboard video recording, Brian goes to the Metro Transit to review this footage. Of course, because he wasn't police, they refused to give it to him, but they did hand it over to the actual police and it would turn out that the footage did show exactly what Brian wanted to see, the taxi that dropped Holly off that night at the time that would have been expected. Only that wasn't the only time the taxi was seen on the footage. It shows that after Holly had been dropped off, the taxi didn't drive back into town. It sat at the corner of a nearby street called Kencrest Avenue, as if driving back towards Holly's apartment building. As Brian suspected early on, something was off with the taxi driver's story that night. Of course, by this point, the police had already spoken to the taxi driver, a man called Paul, and had taken his story at face value, calling him a sort of the earth kind of guy. Paul had said that he'd picked Holly up and she'd sat in the seat behind him and they hadn't spoken the entire journey. Instead, she was rummaging in her bag for something for most of the journey. I couldn't find any confirmation of exactly how long this journey was, but through context clues, I don't think it was exactly a very long drive from the university to Holly's house. After the police spoke to Paul, Brian then went to speak to him himself, and together they went on a tour of Holly's movements on the night she got hurt. Brian said he had a feeling that Paul was withholding something, and eventually he got him to admit that he'd done something he wasn't very proud of that night, something he hadn't admitted to the police. Paul said that he'd stolen from Holly that night, that she'd given him a wad of bills to pay, three twenties and three fives, but the fare was nowhere near that. He says that he only gave her $1.50 change. 
This confused me because Paul said at first that he didn't know Holly was blind, but he must have done if he knew that she wouldn't realise that she'd been shortchanged. Either that or she was so, so, so drunk, but her friends say that she wasn't. He then said that the reason he'd hung around and gone back to the building after he'd left was because he felt bad, but she was nowhere to be seen when he got back there. He also said another reason he turned back round is because as he drove away, he saw Holly walking across the car park in the wrong direction and saw her trip on the curb, which was referenced in the concluding report in the case. The report said that Holly tripped on the curb and injured herself, which then disorientated her more. Paul would tell Brian that he gave the $60 that he took to charity after this fact because he felt so bad, but his story changed often. Weirdly, the police never saw that as a cause to investigate any further. Maybe Paul's story is true. Maybe he really did shortchange Holly and felt bad. Maybe he did see her fall over. But a change in story like that really does warrant a bit of further investigation. A lot of people feel that the taxi driver in this case is suspicious, whether he simply knows more than the story he shared or maybe something more sinister. I mentioned earlier in the video that Holly's bag was found near her head when she'd fallen, but it was missing some vital items. On the Saturday morning at 7am, so not long after Holly herself had been found, Holly's wallet, iPhone, lip gloss and some loose change were found in the car park out the front of her apartment building. It was all found sort of between two cars across the car park from where Paul said he dropped Holly off and the person who found the items said they were kind of spread out, as if they'd been thrown from a passing car. The items weren't all in just like one spot, as if they'd just simply fallen out of her bag. This would suggest that at some point that night, Holly made it to her apartment building, but of course the items could have been placed there or thrown there after the fact. Very similar to how Holly's cane seemed to suddenly appear at the fencing the day after. So we know the investigators' official theory very well by this point, an accidental death due to Holly being so drunk. Disorientated, she somehow wandered away from a building until she accidentally slipped off the footpath, through the brambles, and ended up crawling on her hands and knees through the metal fence, up the concrete abutment, and then she fell 10 metres, two and a half storeys to her ground, causing her eventually fatal injuries. The authorities have stuck with this theory, despite the fact that there's no traces of concrete dust on the knees of Holly's jeans or on her shoes, as you would expect to find. Despite the fact that there were no scratches or marks on the palms of Holly's hands, again, as you would probably expect to find. Despite the fact that there were scratches on the back of her hands, as if she sort of raised her hands up to protect her face. Her cause of death is noted partially as blunt force trauma to the head, but the autopsy report mentions only bruising to the outside of her skull, nothing hugely substantial and no skull abnormalities despite this cause of death. She did have a subdural hemorrhage to the base of her brain on the right side, but there was nothing physical on the outside of her skull, only a small mark on the left side of her head. Although, of course, there's no way of knowing for sure, you would probably expect more significant injuries if you fell two and a half storeys to the ground. To die of blunt force trauma to the head with no outward signs of it, it's not impossible, but it's definitely unusual. As I said before, all the family want is for the police to take Holly's case more seriously, to look into it further. When Marion tried to push the police for answers, she was simply told that she'd been watching too much CSI and was advised to go see a psychic. And as if this time wasn't hard enough for the Bartlett family, just 10 weeks later, Wayne lost his battle with lung cancer. Holly's dad died. In 2013, Marion filed a freedom of information request with the police department, asking for their file on Holly's case and anything related to the investigation. They did eventually send some of the stuff, but not all of it, saying they were withholding certain information on the basis of it being an unreasonable invasion of a third party's personal privacy. Who this third party person is, we don't know. They were completely unwilling to help. In December 2013, Tim Bousquet's article on the case was published and it drew a lot of public attention to Holly's story. It was coverage it hadn't really had up until that point. Around the same time, Holly's family had contacted the chief of police expressing their concerns about the investigation. So, in February 2014, a review was ordered into the Halifax Police's investigation into Holly's death, with the chief saying that he had asked for investigators from Quebec City to look into the case themselves. 
which was finally a step in the right direction, or so you'd think. After a four month review, the Quebec police confirmed that they did also believe that Holly's death was accidental. However, they criticised the Halifax police's handling of the case, saying that the early investigation should have been much, much more thorough. Even if the Quebec police do believe that a more thorough investigation wouldn't have changed the outcome, it may have been enough to alleviate anyone's doubts. The Quebec police said that the canvassing done in the area was not adequate, with local residents not being spoken to until four months later. And they also said that the taxi driver wasn't subjected to a proper interview, only like a 25 minute chat. It took Halifax police too long to find the cane, and they didn't analyse Holly's computer and Facebook account until four years after her death. Had all of this been done, Holly's family may have had more confidence in the outcome, but a poor investigation raised way too many questions. The Halifax chief, Jean-Michel Blaise, said, There's no doubt that there are unanswered questions, but there's unanswered questions not because the investigative tasks weren't completed, there are unanswered questions because the evidence is not there. He also said that they will be working hard to improve in the future. Is that good enough? not really for Holly's family who are still pondering these unanswered questions because they didn't investigate enough. Which brings us to what did actually happen to Holly that night? The What Happened to Holly Bartlett documentary raises an interesting theory in that she had an altercation with the taxi driver that night, whether over money or something else. Holly famously only ever paid for things on a credit card, she never really carried cash, it was just too complicated, credit card was always the main choice for her. So potentially she wanted to pay on cards and the taxi driver said no, wanted to cash and that led to an argument. That is speculation, that seems to be what most people think an argument could have been about if there was one. This potential argument may have been bad enough that Holly felt the need to get out of the taxi earlier. Those who love her say that she was a bit hot-headed, something that may have been compounded by the fact that she was drunk. Maybe Holly never made it to the apartment building at all with a taxi, thinking that she'd be able to get her bearings once out of the taxi and make her way home. But she didn't. She ended up falling down the ditch towards the metal fencing surrounding the apartment. She scratched herself up, maybe injuring herself pretty badly in this fall. Injured and disorientated, she ended up on the other side of the fence. But importantly, this theory says that she never crawled up the apartment at all. The lack of concrete dust on her knees and on her shoes suggests that she'd never been on the apartment. Maybe she injured herself badly enough as she sort of fell off the footpath and slipped down the ditch, that she sort of just crawled to a stop at the base of the apartment, unable to move or help herself. And then the cold, cold weather that night caused her to get hypothermia, which does hit more easily if you've been drinking. This could explain the lack of more serious injuries and the lack of concrete dust on her knees and shoes. It could also explain why Paul kept changing his story, knowing that if he admitted to a disagreement, he'd look more suspicious. Maybe he feels guilty about whatever happened. This is all pure speculation, of course, but it does answer more questions than the police's theory. Or maybe the theory is right that she again got out of the taxi early, but then came across somebody with nefarious intentions, somebody who did hurt her. This person doesn't have to be the taxi driver, it could have been anyone. But if this was the case, then it could explain the injuries. The facts we have here is that Holly got in a taxi and she never reached her front door. The taxi then drove around suspiciously. Was he looking for Holly? Was he telling the truth in that he felt guilty but didn't quite tell the whole story? Maybe he really did see Holly fall, just not outside the apartment building. Maybe he saw her fall somewhere else entirely. The taxi driver's story is so undeniably strange how he kept admitting to more details. Could it be a guilty conscience? But then again, the question remains, how did some of Holly's belongings end up outside her apartment? Were they thrown there from the taxi? Did she really make it all the way there? Maybe. But then how did she end up underneath the bridge? I think we can all agree that regardless of whether this was all one horrible accident or not, the police's version of events just don't quite make sense. There's no way she walked 300 metres in the opposite direction of her apartment building without realising where she was. It simply wasn't in Holly's nature. She was blind. She was not stupid. She knew how to navigate her world and she navigated it very, very well. Had the police listened to the people who knew Holly best and listened to experts in orientation, they never would have come to the conclusion that they did. 
She was undeniably failed by the people who were supposed to be investigating her case. They were uneducated on how a blind person moves in this world. And that should have been the first thing they focus on learning. It's the number one most important thing in this case. If you ask me, Holly's case does deserve to be reopened. It deserves to be looked at from the lens of a blind person. If there are any blind or visually impaired people listening to this video, then please do let me know your opinions on this case because you probably know Holly's world better than anyone else. You'll know sort of where her mindset was. And of course, I'm not blind, I'm not visually impaired, so I can't sort of give the angle. So if there are any of you out there, then please do share. Thank you so much for tuning in this week and I will see you in the next one. Bye guys.